Uh, our speaker today is uh, Stefan Village. Thanks for being with us today. He uh, studied chemistry and uh, interdisciplinary sciences at ETH in Switzerland, obtained his diploma in natural sciences in, in 2000, and then obtained his uh, PhD uh, from ETH in 2004, um, supervised by Friedrich Nagt. Uh, since 2004, or starting in 2004, he was a junior research fellow at uh, Oxford, a lecturer in physical chemistry, university University College London, uh, Swiss National Science Fund professor at uh, the Department of Chemistry, the University of Basel, and is an associate professor at uh, Basel since 2014. He's a member of the Swiss Study Foundation, a junior research, uh, has a junior research fellowship from Christchurch University of Oxford. Christchurch University of Oxford is, has um, been awarded the Medal of ETH the uh, Dimitris uh, Korafas Award, the Malo Medical of the Royal, Royal Society of Chemistry, Ruzicka Prize, and an SNSF uh, Consolidator Grant Award. We are very much looking forward to your talk on quantum control and precision spectroscopy of single trap molecular ions. Thank you very much for being our guest today. Thank you very much, Christian, for the very kind introduction and indeed for the invitation to speak in this uh, online seminar today. It's a great pleasure for me to be here and share some of our recent uh, results with you today. The title of my talk is Quantum Control and Precision Spectroscopy of Single Trap Molecular Ions. And it is um, really about some new techniques that we have developed to uh, read out the quantum state of single molecular ions and uh, in view of using this for spectroscopic experiments. So we'll start the talk with uh, uh, some motivation for what we do. And in order to contrast uh, the new techniques that we have developed, I will also briefly talk about uh, the old way, how we have done state detection and spectroscopy of, of molecular ions in the trap before that. I will then introduce our new uh, method. It's a, it's a quantum non demolition scheme for reading out the state of a single trap molecular ion using coherent motion excitation. And uh, we apply this primarily to N2 plus. This is our favorite molecular ion. I will then also talk a bit about N2 plus and uh, highlight clock transitions and qubits in the system. And I will then finish with an outlook on precise spectroscopic measurements in N2 plus. Uh, also using uh, a new network for the distribution of the Swiss primary frequency standard that we have set up in Switzerland recently. But let me start with a, a short uh, introduction and motivation for our work. So why do we want to control and, and precisely study trap molecular ions? I'm preaching a bit to the choir here, I am aware. Our main um, uh, uh, motivation and aim is to do precision spectroscopy on trap molecular ions. That can be used to test fundamental physics and uh, symmetries, which is the theme of this lecture series. It can be used to um, build new types of clocks based on molecules. There are also uh, avenues to uh, devise new qubits uh, based on, on, on molecular ions. And uh, since I'm in the chemistry department, I also like to highlight in passing that there are also uh, uh, interesting applications in the realm of, of collision physics and, and, and also chemistry. Uh, state controlled and uh, quantum controlled molecular ions. So most of, of, of the experiments in this domain are, are done with atomic systems. And uh, um, compared to atoms, molecules are, of course, much more complicated. They have additional degrees of freedom compared to atoms, in particular vibration and rotation. And this leads to uh, a quite complex uh, molecular energy level structure, even for seemingly simple systems like our favorite molecule N2+. So we have um, electronic transitions, of course, electronic structure, we have vibrations, we have rotations, we have fine structure, we have hyperfine structure, and we have Siemens structure on top of all of that. So, and this complexity poses challenges, right? Starting with internal state preparation, yeah, preparing molecules, or initializing them in a specific quantum state is not straightforward. Then also in terms of cooling, yeah, um, with, with, with atoms, um, one likes to take uh, systems with closed cycling transitions, which are easily laser coolable. Uh, most molecules do not have that. So uh, one has to find other ways. 
this problem then propagates into state detection, um, which uh, also is more challenging because in attempts with closed cycle transitions, one can use these transitions also for readout of the system. This is not possible in molecules if you do not have this transition. And then also coherently manipulating molecules is also more complicated um, because of their complex energy level structure. So um, we've been working on tackling all these problems for yeah, maybe 10 years now. And uh, I'd like to share with you um, some of the techniques and results that we have developed in our group. Um, I, but I also want to highlight that we are not the only ones uh, who work on uh, cold molecular ions and, and, and trying to study and control them as accurately as one can. There is a range of other groups and an ever growing number of groups, I should say, joining this field. And uh, they should also be mentioned at uh, this point. So as I've already said, our favorite molecular ion is N2+. And one of the big advantages of, of working with molecules in general is, 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 is the fact that you have billions of them. Yeah. And uh, so you have, uh, you know, you have choice, right? And you pick this, the molecule, which has the best properties for your specific application. I think this is one of the key advantages of molecules that, that, that you have this enormous choice. And we picked N2 plus because um, it has some quite um, interesting feature in particular in, in the realm of uh, precision measurements. It's a symmetric homonuclear molecule. That means it doesn't have a permanent dipole moment. That means that its rotational and vibrational spectroscopic transition are forbidden within the electric dipole approximation. And this also means that uh, there are only transitions in higher order, for instance, electric quarter pole and magnetic uh, dipole transitions. Um, <clears throat> that means that many of the systematic shifts that uh, one is usually dealing with uh, are very small on these rotational and vibrational transitions. Yeah? Um, stark shifts are very small, um, black body radiation shifts are very small, um, quarter pole shifts can, can, uh, can also be neglected if one chooses uh, uh, the right transitions and the right, the right states. So, and essentially one mainly has to worry about uh, um, uh, the Siemens structure and uh, uh, magnetic hill shifts, which I will come to uh, back to later in the talk. Another important and nice feature about this uh, homonuclear diatomic molecules is, is that uh, they do not couple to the black body radiation field easily. And so this means there's no redistribution of the state populations uh, due to black body radiation. And for experiments with trapped species, this is a, is a main worry um, because these molecules remain in the trap for a very long period of time, yeah. typically minutes, if not hours. And uh, N2 plus has two uh, nuclear spin isomers uh, associated with its rotational ground state with total nuclear spin quantum number zero and two. So essentially you have a choice whether you want to have or not have hyperfine structure in your molecule. Both has advantages and disadvantages. So we use, uh, we, we work with molecular ions instead of neutral molecules. And uh, the main reason being is that uh, if one puts them into a trap and cools them, then um, one can form Coulomb crystals. And uh, these are essentially structures of uh, cold ions uh, in an ion trap. Um, I show you here some fluorescence images of laser cooled calcium ions, which form these Coulomb crystals uh, taken from our experiment. And this is a, a, a technique that has been around for, for a very long time, it has been uh, yeah, chiefly been advanced in the framework of uh, ion trap quantum information experiments, but uh, it is also useful for many other applications, including ours. And the nice thing about these uh, sort of systems is, is that uh, in the trap, the ions then localize and one can, as one can see in these fluorescence images of the calcium ions, one can see and therefore also address and manipulate single ions. And uh, that makes it attractive for all these applications, including ours. Now, um, let me say a few words about the experimental setup that we use. Um, so the, the, the people in my group working on this experiment, they very often like to call this a, an ion trap quantum computer coupled with a molecular beam machine. Uh, I think this is a very nice way of putting it. So the heart of the experiment is, is a, quadrupole, a linear quadrupole ion trap, um, which um, is in which we store the ions and then cool them and then also manipulate them. The molecules themselves are introduced by a molecular beam. 
And uh, so this is a molecular beam of nitrogen molecules, which uh, passes close to the trap, trap center. And here we ionize uh, the nitrogen molecules to form the nitrogen ions with pious lasers. We then have additional lasers for laser cooling uh, the calcium ions and coherently manipulating them. We then have additional lasers, uh, the purpose of which will be clear over the course of my talk and for spectroscopy and coherent manipulation of the molecules. And all of these are referenced to a frequency comb in the end um, for uh, accurate frequency calibration. So uh, one uh, particular problem uh, that I've already highlighted is, is that uh, molecules in general or, or in most cases and the nitrogen, the nitrogen ion in particular cannot be laser cooled. So we have to sympathetically cool it as it is shown here. So we always have uh, calcium ions in the trap, which are laser cooled and which act as a coolant for the nitrogen molecules. The nitrogen molecules, they are, um, they are not visible in these fluorescence images because they do not fluoresce as there are no closed cycling transitions, but we can infer them by, by their presence uh, in, in the coulomb crystal, both by mass spectrometry and also in the images, because we see here is a dark ion which displaces the single calcium ion from the center. Okay, now let me walk you through a few of the, of the main techniques that we use in order to uh, deal with this uh, molecular ions. One important aspect is, of course, state preparation. And uh, it has been a, a problem in the field for quite a long time, um, which has been solved about 10 years ago, more or less simultaneously by various groups with various means. Um, our approach to this problem is the following. So, um, we like to produce the molecular ions already in a way so that they are initialized in a particular rotational and vibrational quantum state. And since these nitrogen ions, in our case, do not couple to the black body radiation field uh, in the experiment, then this, this state is conserved for a, for a very long time. So, and we achieve this by uh, a phot by photoionization of neutral nitrogen molecules. We choose a photoionization sequence that by virtue of photoionization selection rules and those energetic constraints is tailored such that the nitrogen ions are produced in a specific quantum state. So typically the rotational and vibrational ground state. And then we sympathetically cool these nitrogen ions in the trap, um, usually starting with a large Coulomb crystal of calcium ions, which then sympathetically cools um, the nitrogen ions into the center of the crystal. And then we typically get something like this here. Here's a large Coulomb crystal of calcium ions. In the center, you see a region uh, with no fluorescence. This is where the nitrogen ions are, uh, are localized. So if you can simulate this crystal with molecular dynamics approaches, and then in the simulations, you can make this, uh, the nitrogen ions visible. And then you can, by comparison, you can then uh, figure out where exactly the ions are placed and how many you have. Good, so um, the next uh, step is then, uh, well, to make sure, right, that these ions are really state controlled and then do spectroscopy on them in, in some uh, uh, form or another, because this is what uh, we are eventually after. Now, we and essentially the entire field uh, until recently have so far relied on destructive spectroscopic techniques meaning that uh, once these molecular ions are excited, then one induces some sort of chemical change, either photodissociation or a laser-induced reaction in order to detect that the uh, spectroscopic excitation has happened. And then in, in our case, uh, what we adopted is a laser-induced charge transfer technique that has originally been developed by Stefan Schlemme and Dieter Gerlich more than 20 years ago. And which uses an, an, an old trick in, in, in the book of chemical physics Namely, it is been known for a very long time that N2 plus can undergo a charge transfer reaction with argon atoms, but only if the nitrogen ions are vibrationally excited. If they are in the vibrational ground state, then this doesn't happen for energetic reasons. And so and you can use this for vibrational spectroscopy. Yeah? So you can take these nitrogen ions, um, excite them to a vibrationally excited state and detect this via the laser-induced charge transfer state. So uh, that is what we embarked on uh, a couple of years ago to study the vibrational spectrum of N2+. And this is uh, particularly interesting in, in the context of, uh, of, of precision spectroscopy, because as I've already mentioned, these vibrational transitions uh, are electric dipole forbidden. 
So they are allowed in the electric horopole approximation, some of them even in the magnetic dipole approximation. Um, but they are very bare and very narrow and very weak because they are only allowed to a higher order. And to give you a perspective, uh, the first vibration excited state of nitrogen has been computed to have a natural uh, uh, line width of on the order of several nanohertz. And this boils down to a lifetime of the state of about 160 days. Yeah. So this gives you a, a perspective on, on how weak and how narrow these transitions really are. So what we did is we took a quantum cascade laser, irradiated uh, specific, this specific row vibration and hyperfine components in this infrared fundamental band of, of nitrogen with this quantum cascade laser for a couple of minutes. And then we would detect these uh, vibrational excitations via this laser and use charge transfer scheme with our and in the experiments, this, this typically looks like this. Um, we started always off with a big crystal, had the nitrogen ions in the center. Then we would do the spectroscopic sequence, irradiate the ions, introduce the argon atoms. Those which have been incited would undergo charge transfer and be removed from the crystal. And that manifested itself in, in, in subtle changes in the structure of this crystal. Yeah? Um, ions appearing, nitrogen ions appearing from the center. And one has to analyze this, these images quite carefully in order to see these subtle changes. And the problem was is that these transitions were so weak, right, that only a few of these nitrogen ions really reacted away in the time that we had available. Nonetheless, we could record the spectrum um, of specific hyperfine components of these vibrational transitions. And this is uh, a result that we got. Back at the time, we were very proud about this result because it has taken us well, about a year to find these insanely weak transitions and then another couple of months to take these data. So uh, we were very happy about this, but um, uh, at the same time, it also showed the problems, right, with this entire approach. Because if it takes a couple of months to get a spectrum like this, um, and then if one looks at the signal to noise ratio here, then one can already appreciate that it will be very difficult to get really precise data out of this. And the problem in the end was this, this, this destructive uh, um, detection scheme that we were used, right? After every spectroscopic excitation, the ions have to be destroyed in order to be detected. And so this means that we have to reinitialize the whole system every time, right? Reload the ions, prepare them sympathetically, cool them, excite them again, and so forth, right? So the duty cycle of these experiments, in our case, and also for all other experiments in the field that were using these destructive techniques, was very, very low. So um, that, in the end, is a sort of a dead end. So one has to improve on that. And uh, OK, one possibility would be you can now say, OK, just use more particles, right? Get more statistics, get better signal. Um, that could be done. However, um, we opted for the exact opposite. So we used fewer particles, to be precise, only one. But we would then relinquish this destructive detection scheme and uh, adopt a method that uh, would not destroy the molecule. And even more so, it would not even destroy the quantum state during the detection. And uh, so that uh, is a state readout scheme that works on a single molecule and relies on the coherent motional excitation of, uh, of a two-ion crystal. And that yielded an improvement of our duty cycle up to five orders of magnitude. Yeah, and uh, with a concomitant improvement in measurement sensitivity. And at the same time, we remove the ensemble averaging, which is also always a, a very, if you, if you deal with, with many particles. So we were inspired by, uh, to implement these chemi molecules by, by a work from the NIST group on, 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 on atomic ions and aluminum ions, which uh, already appeared 10 years ago. So we adapted this scheme for molecules. And I should also point out that we are, again, not the only ones who, who work on, on, on schemes like this. There was a related experiment on uh, single molecular ions uh, by uh, uh, Pete Schmidt's group at, at PTB and uh, uh, James Chow and D. Leifried at NIST. And there are also other groups working uh, in the field like uh, Michael Sorensen and, and many others. OK, so now how does this work? Let me briefly walk you through the sequence and then uh, show you some uh, results. So it, it starts with the preparation of a calcium nitrogen two ion spring. So an image that I've already shown you, instead of a big crystal, we have one calcium ion and one nitrogen ion. We then sympathetically cool um, <clears throat> this uh, two ion string to uh, the motional ground state 
of one of the normal modes uh, of, of, of these two ion strings, typically the center of mass mode. Um, so in these experiments, we operate in the lamp thicker regime. So uh, the ion trap has to be viewed as a, as, as, as a quantum harmonic oscillator. And uh, we essentially cool down one of these uh, harmonic oscillations to its, uh, to its ground state. Now, the key step is now that once we are, have cooled um, one of the modes down to the ground state, we apply an optical lattice, so two counter propagating laser beam. And the important point is, is that the uh, wavelength of this optical lattice is almost resonant with a strong spectroscopic transition in the molecule in, in, in the nitrogen ion. And in this case, we chose an electronic transition in nitrogen. These are dipole allowed. So we choose a specific electronic transition and choose the lattice laser wavelength to be not on resonance, but uh, uh, close to a resonance in uh, a specific resonance in, in the nitrogen ion. So this means that uh, we generate um, a strong light shift and therefore an, a, a strong optical dipole force on the molecule. So we would then um, modulate the, la the laser, the frequency, uh, or we would modulate the optical lattice at the frequency of the vibration um, that we originally has, have cooled down to the ground state of the trap in order to excite their motion coherently in this case. So uh, the optical dipole force acts at the molecule. We modulate this optical dipole force at the frequency of the motion of these twines in the trap. So we get the coherent excitation of the motion if this optical dipole force is active. And again, it's only active if the wavelength of the optical lattice is close to a resonance in the molecule. And it's only close to resonance if the molecule is in, a, is in the right quantum state for this resonance, right? So this makes the whole scheme uh, state dependent. And then uh, we would um, detect this uh, excitation of the motion by doing uh, sideband rubber thermometry on this calcium ion. So we would use the calcium ion as a, as a sensor, if you will, as a thermometer. Yeah for detecting this motion excitation that has happened by applying the state dependent force on the molecule. Okay, so now let me walk you through these different steps in a bit more detail so that you can appreciate how this works in the experiment. The first step is the preparation of this calcium nitrogen to ion crystal. And that sounds easier than it actually is because uh, the nitrogen ions, they are generated very hot in the experiment. They come from a molecular beam, which is fast. They have produced somewhere in the potential of the ion trap. So they have uh, a lot of kinetic energy, which needs to be taken out. So in order to do this efficiently, we usually start with a large calcium crystal. And then we produce exactly one nitrogen ion by photoionization. And this is then sympathetically pulled into this calcium crystal. And one can see it here, right? Here in the center, it has replaced the calcium ion. So we know, now know there is one nitrogen ion. And then we change the trapping parameter such that uh, we start to, to, uh, uh, to eject calcium ion sequentially from the trap uh, very slowly, so that in the end, we only have one calcium ion left, and of course, the nitrogen ion, and this then uh, brings us our uh, calcium nitrogen two ion string. So the next step is then cooling this ion string to the ground state of one of its normal modes, typically the center of mass mode, as I have mentioned, and we do this by just standard resolved sideband cooling. So for those of you who are not specialists in the field, let me briefly tell you how it works. Yeah, so. Um, we, as I said, we, we operate in a lamp thicker regime here. So this means that if we excite the calcium ion here on a, uh, on a, on a narrow electronic transition, say the calcium clock transition at 729 nanometers, then in the spectrum, we not only observe the bare electronic transition, but we also observe side bands, right? And these side bands, they are associated with a, with a, a simultaneous either excitation or de-excitation of, uh, of the motion of, of the, of, in this case, our two ions in the trap. So if you have a red sideband, um, so this is a sideband which is associated with uh, the de-excitation of the motion by one quantum uh, upon the excitation of this uh, uh, electronic transition in calcium ions. And if we keep exciting this red sideband, then we continuously remove motion and quanta from the system until we end up in the motional ground state. And at this point, then the red sideband vanishes from the spectrum and uh, by analyzing essentially um, yeah, the residual intensity of the red sideband, we can then work out how much uh, or, or the, right, the, 
effective temperature of, of uh, that, that we have in this model in the end of the day. Good. So we now have this uh, calcium nitrogen uh, string in, in, in the ground state of one of its motion. Now we can apply the optical dipole force or the optical lattice. And now we need to look a bit more into the state dependence uh, of this whole process. So nitrogen, of course, has, has many different spectroscopic transitions that are uh, available. So this here is, is a partial energy level diagram of nitrogen uh, on this electronic transition that we are using. And what you see here are specific spin rotational components of these electronic transitions. So uh, excitations where we also change uh, the uh, electron uh, electron spin, um, or which involves uh, also excitations in the electron spin and uh, in the rotation. And uh, they, so they are different available depending from which rotational state you start. And uh, in the wavelength range we are operating, um, we can then uh, look, okay, so what, what, what is the optical dipole force that we generate as a function of this, of, of the la laser wavelength and as a function of the detuning from specific of these um, uh, transitions in the molecule. And I'd like to draw your attention specifically to this one, this is the so-called R11 transition, so don't uh, worry about this spectroscopic notation. Suffice to say, this is a transition that starts from the rotational ground state of, of, the, of the molecule. And uh, so and this is the one that we typically prepare in the experiment. So if we now choose the, the wavelength of the uh, optical lattice to be very close in resonance with this R11 transitions, then we, as one can see from this curve here, we can generate quite a strong optical dipole force, which is then uh, suitable for detecting the molecule in the state. Um, <clears throat> as one can see here, suppose the, the molecule is in a different state, right? For instance, the second excited rotational states, then we have these other transitions here, but they are further detuned from our wavelength of the lattice at this specific point. So the optical dipole force um, that is generated if the molecule was in, in, in these particular, the particular states it is, is much weaker and would not lead to any appreciable motional excitation in our experiment. So this is how we can discriminate between the molecule being in these different uh, spin rotational states. Okay, so if we now initiate this experimental sequence, right, so um, molecule has been prepared in this case the rotational ground state, optical dipole has been ground state cooled to uh, one of its uh, motional modes. Um, we can then apply um, uh, this optical dipole force um, targeting the rotational ground state via the optical lattice. Um, we do this for a, a specific amount of time. This then leads to the coherent motional excitation of the two ions in the trap. And uh, then we do Rabi sideband thermometry uh, on the calcium ion. Uh, specifically, we excite one of the sidebands uh, again and induce Rabi flops on the sideband. And uh, from the uh, frequency of these Rabi flops and also from the contrast that we get in this, uh, in this Rabi spectra, uh, we can then infer the degree of motional excitation that has happened because of this optical dipole force. And this is shown here. So the green trace um, shows. Um, uh, situation uh, when we have uh, no optical dipole force applied to the molecule. So we do not observe uh, a Rabi flop in this specific sequence. But if the optical dipole force was applied, if the molecule indeed was in the rotational ground state in this case and has, has been motionally excited, we then can observe Rabi flops uh, on this uh, uh, particular sideband. If, however, the molecule um, has been prepared in a different state, other than the rotational ground state, then if the lattice is at this particular wavelength, um, we do not observe any uh, coherent motion excitation as inferred by the absence of, of, of any rabbit flops on this particular sideband of calcium. And uh, this is this red, red trace here. And uh, one can see that it is essentially uh, the same as our background. Good, one can then do a bit of uh, 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 statistics and work out what sort of fidelity we have in the state detection if the molecule is in the ground state or if it's not in the ground state. And that is shown here. So this is an experiment where we did about uh, a bit more than 100 of these uh, state detection measurements. And uh, if one analyze 
this measurement series um, statistically, then uh, we find that we have a fidelity of about 99% of establishing that this molecule is really in the ground state. Then after about a bit more than 100 of the state detection uh, uh, measurements, one can see that uh, something has changed. Yeah? Uh, the molecule has undergone some sort of quantum jump and changed its state, yeah? probably because of a collision with the background gas molecule. And so it was not in the ground state anymore. And also in this case, we could infer with a fidelity of about 99% that uh, it is not the ground state of the molecule anymore. Yeah. So this is a quite a high fidelity uh, that one can achieve here in terms of detecting uh, the, the molecular state. But one can then now use this, one can now start to play around with that, right? And as I've said, in the end, what we want to do is some sort of spectroscopy. And a very simple form of spectroscopy that one can already get at this stage is uh, to map out the spectroscopic transitions that, that we use for, uh, for applying the optical dipole force. Yeah? Because I mean, the, the dipole force, it is generated uh, by this transition depends on the detuning of the lattice laser from the center of the transition. So by changing the lattice detuning, we generate different optical dipole forces. And uh, we can then map out essentially the spectroscopic line shape uh, of, of the relevant transition. And this is shown here. Um, you can see here uh, the line shape of this R11 transition that we have been using to generate the dipole force. And uh, these are transitions that have been well known from classical spectroscopy before. So we can now extract the line center, right, and compare this with the literature, and we get very good agreement here. One can even get uh, transition strengths, for instance, in the form of Einstein A coefficients, and compare these with the literature. And also, this is uh, yields an excellent grid. So this 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 really shows yeah, that. Uh, uh, yeah, we understand what's going on here and that one can really um, extract quantitative spectroscopic information from these experiments as well. Okay, so uh, what, what we are now uh, gearing up to is then applying all this to, to infrared spectroscopy again. And uh, in, in this case, we will use some sort of uh, depletion spectroscopy as we call it, uh, when we introduce another infrared laser so that we will, of course, induce a change in the quantum state, which can then be read out again with, with, with these sort of, of transitions. So that, that brings me to the, the fourth part of my talk. Um, the question is, OK, which out of these zillion transitions that, that, that you, in principle, have in a molecular candle, which one should you choose? Yeah. And uh, we have all these different molecular degrees of freedom, right, which are all, uh, which all live on, on, on different energy scales. So you have spectroscopic transitions available over a broad range of the electromagnetic spectrum, starting from RF up, up to the uh, ultraviolet and even extreme ultraviolet. So which one should you choose? And uh, this here shows, again, a partial energy level scheme of, uh, of, of, of N2+. Plus showing its vibrational structure, the fine structure, the hyperfine structure. And uh, you can now think of identifying clock transitions and qubits encoded in all these different degrees of freedom in the molecule. And uh, let's have a, a look at a few examples. Yeah. For instance, if you just look at hyperfine transitions, right, in the I equals two uh, nuclear spin isomer, and you, you have, uh, you can induce hyperfine transitions between uh, these two uh, hyperfine levels here. And what you see here, this is a, um, a map of the Siemens structure of these transitions as a function of an applied magnetic field. And one can then see, I mean, this, we do not get a linear Siemens shift here uh, because, because of the complexity of the energy level structure. We have many, uh, there's a lot of mixing uh, between the different levels when the magnetic field is applied. And so we have very soon, we have a deviation from a linear Siemens shift here. But it is in principle good because this means that we have certain magic conditions with, with some of these transitions um, at which at certain magnetic fields, uh, um, they become insensitive to the Siemens shift at first order. Yeah, so that they are not sensitive to magnetic field fluctuations anymore. And one can find, can find quite a few right already in this hyperfine transition here. And uh, those are the ones that uh, are interesting for precise spectroscopic measurements in the end, uh, because um, yeah, they are not insensitive. They are not, they're not sensitive to magnetic field fluctuations anymore. And as I've already pointed out before, also many of the, of the other systematic shifts that one has to worry about, they are very small in this case. 
Um, you can find other interesting uh, types of transitions here. For instance, let me um, point out um, a feature of rotational transitions that you can have, for instance, here in the in the I equal zero a nuclear spin isomer, so uh, um, the hyperfine less isomer. Um, here in particular, if you look at then this pair uh, fine rotational transition, um, and if you analyze the Siemens structure there, then you find for the stretch, for the transitions between stretched Siemens states, like here, you find uh, a, a very small but linear Siemens shift, yeah, which is also uh, quite favorable for precise measurement. And then finally, the vibrational transitions. Um, uh, there are many different rotation and hyperfine components that uh, you can find in, in this uh, vibrational manifold. And again, you find many transitions, right, uh, where you can uh, realize magic conditions in the sense that uh, at certain magnetic fields, they become quite insensitive to magnetic field fluctuations. And that also in, in terms of vibrational spectroscopy makes uh, makes these transitions quite appealing. So um, at that point, when, when one, one has established a sensitive uh, experimental uh, scheme and uh, also identified the transitions which are, which are worth studying, um, one needs to worry about one final point, and that is the, the uh, accuracy of one's frequency calibration. And uh, so ideally, one would like to compare the frequency that one measures with a primary frequency standard. And uh, in, in, in Switzerland, we have one that is a cesium fountain clock at the Swiss Institute of, of Metrology, uh, METAS. And uh, in the end of the day, we would like to compare all our laser frequencies to this primary standard to have a, a precise reference. Now, the problem is METAS is at Bern, and we are at Basel. And there is a bit more than 100 kilometers difference between these two cities. So we somehow, we somehow need to get um, yeah, this frequency reference to our laboratory in Basel. And in order to achieve this, we have recently set up a, a fiber network for the distribution of, uh, of, of, of the primary frequency standard in Switzerland to different spectroscopy laboratories all over the country, uh, including ours in Basel and then was at ETH Zurich. And that was a collaboration between many groups from ETH, from METAS, and also from our academic network provider, SWITCH, which provides the, the optical fibers. And uh, we were also uh, collaborating uh, with our colleagues at INRIM, Davide Canonico, and Cecilia Trivati, who were also um, uh, who were supporting us uh, with technology that they already have established. Um, this is not the first type of, uh, of, of frequency transfer network that is set up in has been set up in Europe. There have been quite a, a number of them uh, before the one in Switzerland. However, I should point out that one specialty of, of the network that, that we have in Switzerland is that it operates in the telecom L-band at 1572 nanometers uh, compared to yeah, most other European networks that uh, operate in the, in the, in the telecom C-band between 1540 and 1550 nanometers. And the reason why we chose the L-band is the following, is, uh, is that it's essentially empty in Switzerland. So all the, the telecom data traffic is, is routed via the C-band in the network that we are using. And so it was quite congested. And uh, also the, the network provider switch did not want to use us to contaminate their, their C-band network. So we um, essentially um, uh, adopted a scheme which operates in the L-band, which is completely empty and uh, where uh, we have much more flexibility and freedom with what we do. So this frequency transfer is then implemented in the following way. So at, at METAS, we have the, the, the primary standard, um, which then uh, <clears throat> essentially uh, controls the frequency comb. This frequency comb then con stabilizes an ultra, uh, a, 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 an ultra stable laser, which is then injected into the telecom fiber network. Um, in the L-band and transferred to our laboratory in Basel. Yeah, it is regenerated. We also do a, a fiber noise uh, cancellation uh, in, in the usual way um, for this transfer. After regeneration, then um, 
the uh, signal is then injected in part of it is then used for experiment the other part is then injected again into the fiber network goes on to zurich is regenerated again there <clears throat> and then uh, it is sent back to burn so that we can close the loop and, and have a, a round trip uh, comparison and characterization of the entire signal and what you see here is, is, is essentially the uh, phase noise power spectra density that, 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 that we measure um, with and without the fiber noise cancellation for the entire loop of the network. Um, you can see here the situation when the noise cancellation is off here is when it is on. The gray trace shows uh, what we would, would expect um, in an ideal situation to achieve. And one can see that uh, the whole noise cancellation works, uh, works very well. So um, we've now started to use this um, uh, precise frequency reference to indeed reference our lasers to the 729 nanometer laser that we are using for our uh, experiment. Also acts as a, a kind of a master laser in our laboratory to which all other lasers are referenced. This laser now is referenced to uh, the, the meta standard. And this here shows a, a, a comparison of the stability of these lasers. Um, after reference to the meta standard um, in comparison to what we did before, which was just a reference to a local rubidium clock disciplined by GPS. And one can see that we have an improvement of about two orders of magnitude stability already in the very first tries uh, with this uh, uh, frequency transfer network. Okay, so this already brings me to the end of my talk. Um, I hope I could have shown you uh, a new method which enables the non-destructive detection of molecular quantum states. It is essentially quantum non-demolition, so we can you know, detect the same state over and over again without destroying the molecule or the state. It is therefore highly sensitive, much more sensitive than everything we were able to do before. And this then is the basis for new approaches to molecular ion spectroscopy. And uh, applications of this we envisage in, in precision spectroscopy, as I've already said, said but uh, it also opens the door to more advanced experiments in the realm of uh, molecular quantum technology and also to state to state chemistry, which is a completely different topic that uh, I'd be happy to talk about at a different occasion. So uh, I'd like to <clears throat> acknowledge the work of. Uh, uh, the people who actually did it. So this is the team working that has been working on these experiments. Uh, Gregor Hegi, Kavena Chavian, Nikolai Robushki, Alex Schlückhoff and Moody Zinhal were or are PhD students working on this. Uh, Sif Meir was the senior postdoc on this experiment. He has recently moved on to a faculty position at the Weizmann Institute. I'd like to acknowledge the collaboration that, uh, that we had on, or have on the frequency transfer. That is uh, the remainder of the group. I'd like to acknowledge all our sponsors and I thank you for your uh, kind attention and for listening. Thank you very much. <laughs>